thank you all for coming, but and thank you to Jean, Mary, and Barry at Bookham for having us and also for just having this bookstore because I think you guys are the last remaining mystery bookstore in Los Angeles. Is that true? Yes. So I'm glad you're still here. Anyway, most of you, all of you really know me, so I thought what there's some things you might not know about me and why I wanted to become a TV writer in keeping with the theme of this book about a, an assistant who comes to LA to write for television. And when I was very young, I loved TV. And even though my parents were school teachers, they enabled my television watching. I was the kid who would be out playing in the fresh air with my friends and my mother would come out and go, Lisa, Mission Impossible is on, come in. <laughs> so when I, in graduate school I announced that I was moving to LA to write for television and my parents were stunned. I was like, really? Seriously? <laughs> Uh, but is actually how I developed an interest in writing for television because I was always watching. And I started to think it would be really cool to actually write for the shows I watched. And I, and I have to say, one of my greatest experiences, one of my shows that inspired me to write for TV was Star Trek, the original Star Trek. And, but it was on reruns. I was way too young when it first aired. And I thought, I want to write for Star Trek. And a dream come true, I came out here, flash forward, Star Trek The Next Generation, and I was hired to go in and write a Star Trek The Next Generation. And that was so exciting for me. I started out as an office temp in LA, and I was temping at Orion TV and for a writer-producer who was looking to develop projects, and I became friendly with the office manager. And the TV series Cagney and Lacey was launching, and they needed writer's assistant. And Louise, who was the office manager and who liked me and knew I wanted to be a TV writer, put my resume on top of the assistant's piles. And because she felt that if I was in there, if I was established as a writer's assistant and my bosses got to know me, they would hire me to write a Cagney and Lacey. And that's exactly what happened. I was a writer's assistant on the show. I had written a spec Hill Street Blues and a spec Cagney and Lacey. And even though I tell my students, never, never, never write a spec for a show you want to write on, I having been on Cagney and Lacey and knowing, watching them sh shoot the episodes, getting to know the actors, the writers, when they read my Cagney and Lacey, the producers, they didn't buy my Cagney and Lacey, but they hired me to write a Cagney and Lacey because they felt that I captured the voices, that I knew the show. Interestingly enough, after I wrote that episode, wrote a couple of more freelance uh, episodes for other shows, my Cagney and Lacey ended up on a pile at Falcon Crest. And it went to the executive producer, Jeff Freilich, who was looking for a writer, and he called me in for a meeting. Now, I was still a secretary. At this point, I had left Cagney and Lacey. I was now an assistant for two writer-producers. They had a show called K. O'Brien Surgeon. And my agent at the time called me, and she said, there's a producer on Falcon Crest who wants to meet you. And I truly had no idea what the meeting would, would be. And so I went in and met with him. And apparently, he's very good friends with Tyne Daly. And when he read the script, he felt I had captured Tyne's voice perfectly. And so he so we chatted for a while, and he said to me, well, I see you don't have two heads. You're my new story editor. And so I literally went from being an assistant to a writer overnight. And the funniest thing was is I had to drive back over the hill to my assistant's job and Culver City, and um, one of my bosses was stretched out on the sofa, and he goes, so how did the meeting go? And I said, I'm the new story editor, and he went, boop, right off the couch. 
<laughs> and that's essentially how I launched my career as a TV writer. I did a year on Falcon Crest. In fact, the next book in the Susan Kaplan series will be about my experiences on Falcon Crest. The names will be changed to protect the guilty. Um, and Susan will have gone from assistant to story editor. And then, so some from Falcon Crest, I went to Dallas and I wrote for two years on Dallas. And then I did a year and a half on Knott's Landing. And in the middle of all of this, I did the Star Trek and I did a murder she wrote, which was great fun. And, but then I was pigeonholed as a soap writer, which happens. And I simply could not get work in primetime anymore. And I moved into daytime to Sunset Beach. Aaron Spelling was developing a soap uh, for daytime. And there was an agent at the time who had been, for years, had been calling me. He wanted to represent me. And I was like, no, 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 I don't want to go into daytime. But I did want to write for Sunset Beach because I wanted to write for Aaron Spelling. So I said to him, if you can get on, if you can get me on Sunset Beach, I will sign with you. And he did. He got me on Sunset Beach. Now, interestingly enough, I had to submit a script for Sunset Beach. And what I submitted was my NYPD blue spec, which you think would not really go with a story about these young, sexy 20-somethings on the beach in Southern California. But the showrunner, the head writer, when he met with me, really liked the script a lot. And so he hired me, and I had to fire my then agent, which was a very difficult thing to do. But I went with Jim, and he's been my agent on soaps ever since. I do want to introduce Andy Zack back there, who is my agent and publisher for Killer Ratings, who has been a loyal friend and agent for a long time, because I wrote this book a long time ago, and a mutual friend gave it to him, and he signed me on immediately. I think so. <laughs> I tell you, yeah, I think so. And he and you stuck by me through thick and I never told you this, but it when it made its first round in New York and it got rejection after rejection and I think it was done. And um every time you called or sent me a letter, this was even before email. I thought it was it was going to be Andy firing me, so I would always open that letter with some trepidation, like oh, and it never was, and so thank you, thank you, and he was when I suggested when Andy had mentioned that he was going into the publishing business, and I said, and at the time, what did we call this? A killing in the ratings. Thank you, Robert Masello, for the title, Killer Ratings. Um, and Andy said immediately, yes, and then we just went full speed ahead. There was no doubt about going, so thank you very much. So I'm going to read the first chapter, and um, any similarities for the camera? Coincidence. <laughs> I have a vivid imagination. Your job, said Rebecca Saunders, after taking a sip from her vodka Collins, is to take the blame for my mistakes. She was gripping the glass so tightly her knuckles were turning white. I was so astonished the chunk of cashew chicken I was chewing got stuck in the back of my throat. I started coughing. Rebecca's baby blues, up, baby blues widened. Are you all right? she asked in faux concern. I nodded as I reached for my glass of water, swallowed. I'm fine, I gasped, still a bit short of breath, due more to her pronouncement than the piece of chicken that was still wedged in my throat. Rebecca's feigned concern evaporated, and she continued as if I wasn't about to asphyxiate in the middle of the plum tree in dining room. Fortunately, I rarely make mistakes, so you won't be working too hard in that department. She offered up a light, tinkly laugh, hoping I was sure to sound like wind chimes, but reminding me instead of shattered glass. I could only stare at her in silence, not wanting to make a scene in the elegant pink damask restaurant by writhing on the floor, slowly choking on cashew chicken and her insincerity. 
Rebecca, however, must have mistaken my oxygen-deprived bug eyes for disbelief because her smile disappeared and she abruptly pushed aside her mostly untouched steamed vegetable plate. She leaned across the table, looking earnest. All kidding aside, you really do have to take better care of me. If I need you to pick up my clothes from the cleaners, you'll do it. If I'm working through lunch, you'll take my lunch order, get the food, and bring it to me. Everything you do for Peggy and Zach, you'll now do for me. And you'll make coffee for me each morning, decaf, and you'll wash out all my mugs and utensils at the end of the day. If I had been able to get air into my lungs, I would have told her that I didn't know how to make coffee. It was a skill I had never mastered in spite of two years of all-nighters in graduate school. Rebecca continued, oblivious to my distress. Did the woman not notice I was turning blue? Oh, one more thing. You'll straighten out my desk each morning before I arrive. Put the colored pages into my scripts. File memos. She paused and opened my mail. She said the last somewhat portentously, studying my reaction, seeming to think opening her mail, and who gets mail anymore anyway, should have a deeper meaning for me than it did. I could hold out no longer. My chest spasmed and a giant cough erupted out of my throat, dislodging the chunk of chicken and sending it flying across the table, straight onto Rebecca's gray silk blouse. We both stared at the morsel as a tiny piece of half-chewed <laughs> cashew slid off the meat and into Rebecca's lap. Rebecca glared at me, her blue eyes narrowed and calculating. She reminded me of Mrs. Virgin Mary, the sleek and spoiled Siamese cat owned by the Cavellos, my next-door neighbors back home on Long Island. Mrs. Virgin Mary, so named by the youngest and brattiest Covello, Anne Marie, had all the sensitivity of a sociopath. Staring into Rebecca's glittering blue eyes, I could almost hear the snick-snick of Mrs. Virgin Mary's claws flicking open in anticipation of my sockless ankle or unwary bare hand. Although Rebecca was not a missus, and she was certainly no virgin, I instinctively moved my hands into my lap and out of her sight. I thought I was supposed to work with the two producers, I said, hoping that if I ignored the little faux pas on Rebecca's chest, she would too. Rebecca smiled through clenched jaw muscles. She took her napkin and daintily removed the chicken from her blouse, placing it on my side of the table next to my plate. You work for all three of us, she said. You work with anyone who needs you. That's what television production is all about, teamwork. She stole a sip of vodka as if rationing each swallow. Listen, Susan, I like you. I really do. But you're an assistant, which is only a glorified name for secretary. And secretaries work for whomever their bosses tell them to. Whomever? I was impressed. I had been a straight age student in college. I had a master's degree in English literature from an Ivy League school. I had even won the F. Scott Fitzgerald Award for creative writing. So I liked the whomever. But it didn't mean I liked taking the blame for a woman who, in the past two months I had known her, had mistakenly admitted some of the crew's names on title cards, given the post-production supervisor the wrong dates for dubbing sessions, and forgotten to distribute the network's air date schedules to the writing staff. As if sensing my reluctance, Rebecca tried a softer tack. Look, I know you don't want to be an assistant for the rest of your life. In fact, I heard you've written a spec script. I can get it read, maybe get you an assignment on the show. But you have to help me here. We have to help each other. She smiled again, but it didn't reach her eyes. She took another swallow of her drink, started to call the waiter over for a refill, caught me looking at her and waved him away instead. Who told you about my spec script? I tried to keep the fear out of my voice. If Rebecca found out that my script was already in the hands of one of the show's producers, I had no doubt she'd make sure my dream of becoming a television writer would remain just that, a dream. There are no secrets in the office, she said, but her eyes shifted away from mine, and I knew she wasn't telling me the entire truth. She reached for her glass, realized it was empty, and used her hand instead to cover mine, which had accidentally crept out of my lap and back onto the table. I tried not to show my distaste. Her hand was cold and clammy and felt like the skin of a pet salamander my brother Larry and I kept when we were kids. I noticed that she had chewed her nails through the coral pink polish. Working for me isn't as bad as it sounds, she said. I did the same things for my boss when I first started out. Now look where I am. You could be me one of these days. God forbid. I slid my hand from hers and reached for my glass of 7-Up. I wasn't thirsty, but I didn't want her to feel my skin contracting at her touch. But the job description said, Fuck the job description, she shouted so suddenly I jumped in my seat. You work for me or not at all. 
Her hand shook as she lifted her glass, remembered yet again it was empty, and abruptly put it down on the table. Are we clear? I stared blindly at the other diners, suddenly feeling five instead of twenty-five. I mentally recited the opening stanza of Dancing Queen by ABBA, my favorite song by my favorite group, until the urge to inflict physical damage on Rebecca had passed. The other diners, who had paused to stare at us, resumed their conversations. At that moment, I wished I had never moved to L.A., Stalling for a reply, I reached again for my 7-Up and wondered with dread how long it would be before I, too, was sucking down vodkas like water. How badly did I want to be a television writer? Badly enough to put up with Rebecca and her petty needs and phony smiles? I thought of returning to New York with my tail between my legs, the pitying looks on my parents' faces as they tried not to say I told you so. If I couldn't handle one measly associate producer with a Napoleon complex, then how was I going to survive executive producers and studio executives with God complexes? I could handle Rebecca. I had to handle Rebecca. I just didn't have to become her. My spine stiffened, as did my resolution. Yes, we're clear, I said, looking at her straight in the eye. I'm sorry about the attitude. I guess I didn't understand what I was supposed to do. Good. She relaxed back into her chair, the anger dissipating. I can understand things may not have been made clear to you when you first started working for us, she said, the us meaning the writing staff of Babbitt and Brooks, a moderately successful hour-long drama series about two women lawyers. But it's been two months already, and you need to realize working in television is not as glamorous as most people think it is. The glamour was gone for me the minute I received my first paycheck, I said, surprised I could still joke. Rebecca refused to smile. No one understands it's a privilege to work in television. You all think jobs should be handed to you on a silver platter, but TV jobs are hard to get, and in this economy, almost impossible. I fought tooth and nail to become associate producer, but I deserved the job. No one worked harder than I did to get it. I paid my dues, just like you have to if you want to get ahead. There was an edge to her voice, a defensiveness that I had noticed throughout lunch. She looked at her empty glass, said to hell with it, and held it up high to catch our waiter's attention. When he returned with a new vodka Collins, Rebecca winked at me before taking a sip. Our little secret, okay? I nodded as I watched her take another sip, her hand shaking. She tried to steady it with the other, and her eyes slid toward mine to see if I noticed. I looked away, pretending ignorance. For a moment, I had caught a furtive, hunted look in her eyes, and I realized Rebecca wasn't shaky, defensive, or edgy because she needed a drink. Rebecca was shaky, defensive, and edgy because she was afraid. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, she should be afraid.